speaker. We now go on to the next session, a uh, very uh, important area, visualizing Crohn's disease. To chair this session, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Sanjeev Sachdeva, who is a professor of gastroenterology at the GB Pant Institute of Medical Education and Research in New Delhi. And along with him, we have Dr. Pratap Venigala, who is, uh, who is working at Engine Healthcare uh, in Guntur. Uh, over to you, chairpersons. The current talk is on uh, fistulizing Crohn's disease clinical approach. I'd uh, like to invite uh, Dr. Florian Reeder from Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, to start the talk. Over to Dr. Reeder. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation. I've, I've never been to India. I, I always wanted to go and now I can at least claim I visited you virtually and I was happy to see uh, Dr. Kochar who was in fact um, working with us not, uh, not too long ago and I'm, I'm very glad to see that he's doing well. So today we are talking about a different topic, fistulizing Crohn's disease and how to approach that clinically in, in our patients. These are my disclosures. We work a lot with industry uh, to develop novel drugs to affect tissue remodeling in inflammatory bowel disease. So the case is a 42-year-old female with ileal Crohn's disease was diagnosed 10 years ago, is on long-term acetylprine monotherapy with minimal symptoms, and presents acutely with perianal pain, and says, I have a bump on my bottom and has fever. On the perianal exam, has an area of tenderness and fluctuation, and one additional area with drainage in the MR of the pelvis shows complex perianal disease. Colonoscopy indicates moderate disease activity in the terminal ileum, but also in the rectum with no fistula tract visualized on endoscopy. And as you can tell, this patient has perianal Crohn's disease. The epidemiology um, has been elucidated by the, in fact, with a lot of data also coming from the Mayo Clinic and the speaker following me, Dr. Loftus, but in, in Olmsted County uh, cohort, for instance, in Crohn's disease patients over 20 years, 50% develop any type of fistula and about half of them uh, are a perianal fistula. So this is a big problem for our patients with Crohn's disease. And one may always ask, is prevention the best therapy? Because we know that we have a relapsing remitting inflammatory disease course that you see here in red, but then over time, patients develop tissue damage in the form of strictures, fistulas or abscesses. And biologics work better early on compared to later in the disease course. So there may be a higher potential for response to current treatment early on in a window of opportunity. But is this really the case in patients with Crohn's disease and perianal manifestations? And it seems to be with accumulating evidence that in fact, the incidence of perianal fistula is decreasing and the incidence of proctectomy is decreasing in the biologic era. And on the left, in the dotted line, we can see the post-biologic error, and in the solid line, the pre-biologic error, and the incidence of perianal fistulas is reduced. And on the right, you can see the same seems to be happening for the incidence of proctectomy. So biologic therapy appears to help prevent a perianal disease. How do we classify these patients? Like the patient that just presented when they come into our uh, clinical practice. And we, we in our center use the AGA classification for perianal fistulas. I think it's clinically quite useful because it's relatively easy to do to separate into simple fistulas and complex fistulas. The simple fistulas have a low tract, a single external opening, no abscess, rectovaginal fistula or stricture. Whereas a complex fistula has a high tract, may have multiple external openings and may be associated uh, with pain suggestive of an abscess, maybe associated with rectovaginal fistula or stricture. And why does that matter? I think it matters because the durable remission rate for simple fistulas is much better than for complex fistulas. We need to be more aggressive for complex fistulas in our patients. What we do with the patient I just presented, we would get imaging with MRI or endoscopic ultrasound, depending on the expertise in the center. And then every patient should have an endoscopy, which our patient already had. We involve the surgeons early, particularly if the patient has complex 
fistulas. And the information I gave you in the first slide about moderate proctitis is important because you want to treat proctitis aggressively if patients have severe proctitis. This is a risk factor for future surgery. And why do we use a combination of modalities to diagnose perianal disease? And on the left, you see the three modalities, MR pelvis, endoscopic ultrasound, and examination under anesthesia. And you see the accuracy for each one of those. And we choose two of them together with endoscopy because when you combine the two, the diagnostic accuracy um, is very strong, um, even though each individual one already has a high diagnostic accuracy. But we at the Cleveland Clinic, usually use MR pelvis in combination with exam under anesthesia and endoscopy. So now we have diagnosed our patient and what type of perianal disease this patient has. And now the question is, how do we treat it? And I'm going to go over the different drug classes that are being, have been examined for perianal fistulas in Crohn's disease. And the first one is antibiotics and antibiotics alone. We really do not have much controlled data, and it's all short-term. What you can see here for ciprofloxacin and metronidazole is that nominally there was an improvement over placebo in terms of fistula remission, but all of this was not significant. And when you combine it, in this case ciprofloxacin with biologics and fliximab or adalimumab, in this case at 24 weeks with, combined with adalimumab, you found a significantly improved response if you add on an antibiotic to a biologic compared to a biologic alone. But again, only short-term data. And it seems that antibiotics improve symptoms and may contribute to healing in the short term. Uh, but uh, long-term data is missing, plus side effects may prevent long-term therapy. And so this is how we use antibiotics uh, is short-term. What about immunosuppressors for perianal disease? For thiopurins, there are no randomized controlled trials. There is a meta-analysis suggesting an increased clinical response and over placebo when they are used. For methotrexate, no relevant trial data, only small case series. Cyclosporin, no relevant trial data. And uh, tacrolimus, only short-term data, randomized controlled trial over 10 weeks that showed an improved response when patients received oral tacrolimus over placebo. So thiopurins may have a moderate effect based on meta-analysis, really no data for methotrexate and cyclosporin and tacrolimus shows therapeutic benefit um, with long-term data uh, missing. The mainstay of therapy really is infliximab for fistulizing Crohn's disease. And this is the only biologic that has been tested in a randomized controlled trial with perianal disease being the primary endpoint. And you see that on the left, the pivotal trial in the space Fliximab 5 and 10 milligrams per kilogram being effective for fistula closure in patients with Crohn's disease. And it also works as a maintenance therapy compared to placebo, uh, where the time uh, to uh, a loss of response is significantly increased if the patient is on infliximab compared to placebo. So it works in induction and it works in maintenance for perianal disease. Do the other anti-TNF drugs also work? In this case, adalimumab and sertolizumab are the two that are approved for Crohn's disease in the United States. And adalimumab did not show significant short-term closure. And the same is true for sertolizumab. However, in these trials, as mentioned prior, perianal disease was not the primary endpoint. So the numbers of patients is low and you may not get significance, even though it may work. And there is indication for that because you see the CHARM trial with adalimumab here on top. It, it works for maintenance therapy. In my personal opinion, while infliximab is the go-to drug, we have the most experience and the highest level of evidence. My personal experience is that all anti-TNFs work for perianal disease. And it just the difference is that the trials have not been designed in a way uh, to show that in a randomized controlled fashion. One big take home message of this presentation is that uh, you have to combine medical therapy with surgical management. And this improves the initial response, which you see in orange over medical therapy alone in blue, and it reduces the recurrence rate over time. So our patients respond better and do better longer term if you combine surgical management with 
medical management. So the surgeon is an important member of our care team in this scenario. And one other difference to luminal disease is we may manage infliximab or our biologics in this case a bit different because there is association data that higher levels of infliximab are associated with a better rate of fistula healing. And you see that here that uh, healing as, uh, levels of infliximab that were associated with healing were 16 versus no healing 4.4. So we may need to do higher doses of infliximab or reduced frequency of infliximab to be uh, around a target trough level of 15 to 20 to be most effective for perianal disease. We mostly use combination therapy in these cases because there's an improved uh, rate of fistula closure and we give infliximab uh, long-term in our patients. And the reason is if you stop biologics, even when the fistulas are closed, in almost all patients, perianal disease will come back. So biologics are a long-term therapy in our patients and we usually do not stop it. We now have many other biologics approved or in the pipeline for Crohn's disease and do they work in perianal disease as well. And this is only post-hoc analysis of the patients that have been included in these trials for luminal disease. And what you can see on the left, so this is vedolizumab, Example, you see a nominally increased fistula closure with vedolizumab and a faster time to fistula closure with, with vedolizumab, but this is all nominal. This is not statistically significant, which is because these are underpowered to show a difference with this endpoint. And if you mirror this data into a design that was, as was used for infliximab, my sense is that likely these medications also will work in perianal disease. And what we await is a phase four study with vedolizumab and fistulizing Crohn's disease that currently exists in abstract form, but also indicates that vedolizumab is working in perianal Crohn's disease. The same is true for eustekinumab, because when you combine the eustekinumab trials, 35 unit T1 and unit T2, again, you have a nominal increase in percent proportion of patients in fistula resolution on the left, you see the week eight data. On the right, you see the maintenance data. And here, during maintenance, there was a significant difference in the patients on eustekinumab compared to controls. But again, both induction and maintenance technically underpowered to show a difference between these groups because this is a pooled data from the luminal eustekinumab trials. So dedicated prospective studies are needed to better evaluate the efficacy of this drug for fistulizing Crohn's disease. We have a new option for perianal disease, um, stem cell therapy that is approved in Europe and is in clinical trials in the United States. And this trial we learned a lot from. In, in, first of all, we have a new endpoint, which not only uses clinical assessment, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but also imaging uh, as an endpoint of pelvic um, MRI assessing uh, fluid collection. One other big learning point is in fact the orange bar you see here, which is the placebo arm. And you may wonder why is the placebo rate in this trial so high, 35 or 38% at week 52. And this is in fact the surgical arm. It was a st standardized way to surgically treat the strictures and then the stem cells or placebo was injected around the internal opening and around the fistula tract. So in other words, surgical management alone has a very high success rate and the stem cells add on top of that with a delta of around 15% or so. So this is a, a, a medicate, uh, an approach that will likely come. Infrastructure wise, quite challenging, needs significant expertise, but I think could be, become an option for refractory patients. And before I, I wrap up, just a few words on how do we assess fistulas in clinical practice and in most trials, and for the longest time in our clinical practice, we manually compressed the external fistula tract. And you see an example on the left, but you can imagine um, if you uh, have a different body size, different thumb size and different compression depth and intensity, you get different results from this endpoint or from this observation. And this is really not a particularly reliable way um, of doing this. And there is an emerging field in which that we now have reliable indices to track 
fistula improvement and fistula healing on MRI that have been tested using index development methodology, and this is now available. So how do we combine and how do, you, how do we combine all what I just told you in the last 15 minutes? So we get a history and physical exam, we do an endoscopy in our patients and then combine two of the three endoscopic ultrasound, MRI and exam under anesthesia. In simple fistulas without rectal inflammation, um, that we treat them with either immunosuppressant or anti-TNF, in our case, mostly anti-TNF. And if they fail, can consider fistulotomy because they're superficial, fibrin glue, we didn't talk about that, the data is mixed. But if you do not succeed, you would actually then consider uh, escalating therapy or treating them as complex disease. If you have rectal inflammation, you wanna be more aggressive to treat this rectal inflammation with combination therapy because it portends a poor prognosis. And then for complex fistulas, critical always involves the surgeons, drain any fluid collections with, uh, for, with uh, cetones and use combination therapy. If, this, if there is a success, once the fistula tract dries up, you can consider removing the cetone and con continue maintenance therapy. But if you have treatment failure, you do have options if you fail anti-TNF to go to the other biologics to tacrolimus or consider stem cell therapy. Fecal diversion is an option, but most patients do not get reversed over time and then ultimately proctectomy in a refractory cases. Special situations, and this is the last slide, rectovaginal fistulas is a very clinically very tough situation to treat. You wanna get the patient down to acceptable levels of drainage you should place a ceton if there is an abscess and you have to drain abscesses and fluid collections, but this is very uncomfortable for the patients to carry a ceton. Non-healing perianal fistulas, think about malignancy. There have been multiple reports that cancer can develop in fistula tracts. And then you have these extreme cases, what we call the watering can perineum, multiple complex perianal fistulas that often require diversion and ultimately proctectomy. But we need to be honest with our patients because once they are diverted, more than half of them are never reversed. So in summary, the best treatment for fistulizing Crohn's disease may be prevention and the optimal management requires a, combi a combination of gastroenterologist and surgeon. Fliximab and stem cells are the only therapies for which treatment of perianal fistulizing disease has been studied as a primary endpoint Dedicated studies for perianal disease using this as an endpoint are needed and reliable endpoints are now becoming available. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy uh, to take questions. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Vita, for an excellent comprehensive talk on fistulizing Crohn's disease. You have touched upon all the important areas. Uh, there are a few questions. What is the role, any role for fecal microbiota transplantation in patients with the refractory fistulizing Crohn's? Yeah, so I'm not aware of data that has examined that in a controlled fashion. And even a fecal microbial transplantation for IBD therapy is still in the early stages, in my opinion. There is some information that it may help uh, when you repeatedly apply uh, the um, uh, transplantation so rather than just once. Uh, my personal opinion is I would if at all, try this only in an experimental and controlled setting in combination with best available therapy, which then would be biologics plus minus stem cell uh, therapy, because I, at this point in time, I'm not sure if this alone would be a service to the patient. There are two uh, special situations. One is pediatric Crohn's disease with the uh, difficult or complex uh, perianal fistula. Any, any comments or observation in this scenario? And second situation is a pregnant female in second or third trimester presenting with simple or complex perianal fistula in presence of Crohn's disease. Yes, so I, I'm sorry, I did not hear the first one, but I can answer the second one. And then I would ask you, uh, I, would, I did not understand the first question. So in terms of pregnant patients, when they have a perianal disease, we usually recommend a cesarean section um, in, uh, for, for delivery in, in general, when they are on a biologic with perianal disease and are under control, based on data that is now coming from, from, um, from uh, perianal 
biologics, it, a peri, um, perioperative biologics is safe to continue biologics through delivery. And I would keep patients on biologic and then do cesarean section when they have perianal disease. And, and sorry, what was the first question? The first question was regarding which is the best uh, approach in pediatric Crohn's disease with perianal fistula? Pe pediatric? Yeah. Ah, okay, so also good question. Um, very tough in that there is really, so, so the pediatric field adopts the adult trials without the drugs really being approved or tested in that population. So from that uh, standpoint, I personally would, would say you approach this exactly the same way you approach it in adults with infliximab being the first choice. There are now trials starting with stem cell therapy in the pediatric perianal population, which in this case, local therapy you know, may uh, find more uptake than, for instance, in adults. But at this point in time, I would treat that just the same way uh, I would treat it in adults. Now, I request Dr. Pratap to ask a few questions before we wrap up. Well, I, I think we're getting a message from the organizers that uh, they're short of time. I think we'll uh, take the questions later. We'll close the session and uh, hand it over to the next. So we thank Dr. Ryder, Dr. Pratap, my co-chair. We hand over the session to Dr. Vishal. Thank you, Vishal. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ryder, and thank you all the chairpersons. Uh,